Hi, everybody. We are in study number seven of James' letter to dispersed uh, Jesus believers of Jewish descent. Glad to have you with us. Uh, if you want to catch up, these stream studies are on the Southside Church of Christ Facebook page uh, and uh, by successive Wednesdays. Just look for the Wednesday night date and you will see studies one through six already there on the Southside Church of Christ Facebook page. I also include them on my own uh, personal page, Paul Woodhouse Facebook page, and you can just look those up as well, along with uh, the Gata Minutes, which I'm, I'm currently doing. And you'll find all those James Bible studies up to this point. So uh, I look forward to studying James 2 with you today, but first let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, bless us as we uh, study together. We undertake a study of your word with great intensity and a great desire to do your will as James, inspired of the Holy Spirit, has commanded us to do. Help us not to look at ourselves in a mirror and walk away, but to dwell on your image within us. And Lord, help us to study this and to understand correctly, but even more importantly, to act on it correctly, enthusiastically, and lovingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we're going to start in James 2, verse 8, and uh, the reading will be chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 13. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convict uh, and are com convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Wow, there's a bunch of content here in those six verses. Let's look at them together. It's, it's challenging and it's wonderful. I do want to teach this in the verses context to begin with, and then we can begin to mushroom our thinking out some from the immediate context of the verse. Uh, when chapter 2 of James begins, uh, James is addressing something that's going on among the Jewish believers in the early church. And remember here, we're talking about some of the earliest years of Christ followers, assemb Christ followers assembling as a church. We're talking probably around 40 AD, which would have only been 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So James, this is believed to be the earliest Penned of all the New Testament writings, there likely were not any other New Testament writings even out there at the time that James was written. So all they had was the Law of Moses and the Prophets and, of course, uh, the, uh, the writings as well. Uh, and he speaks of people of means and power attending their services, and the Christians would fawn over them they would take a special care to make sure they were welcomed, to, um, to just be there in ways that are, you know, they would go overboard. Whereas now, then they, 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 in that situation, they had poor folks that were also attending, and these poor folks were being treated badly or being neglected entirely. He, James calls them judges with evil thoughts that they would distinguish the rich from the poor in treating each of these groups differently. He argues, uh, James does, that what's happening is, is that the people who are oppressing you, the rich, are getting special treatment, while the poor who have never mistreated you and are in need of a savior, you're not treating them right at all. And so he pointed that out and he called them judges and said that they needed to stop doing that. That is the context uh, that he's been talking about showing partiality. And then James closes the deal in the verses that we talk about today. And he says, first of all, I want you to live by the royal law. 
live the royal law. And the royal law is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That word royal literally means kingdom or the king's law, the royal law. If a king would make a law, it was a royal law. It's a very interesting use of this word, which is not often used in the New Testament. Uh, it comes directly from, the, it's a root, is the word for kingdom. So this would be the kingdom law uh, of Jesus Christ. And there's a, there is a scene in Jesus' life in Jerusalem uh, where he is uh, being questioned and there's an effort to trap Jesus in his own words or perhaps catch him in making a theological mistake. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees are very carefully questioning uh, Jesus in Jerusalem, and this was in the week before his crucifixion. And in Matthew 22, it says in verse 36 that Christ was asked, Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus had an answer for them in verse 37 of Matthew 22. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now what Jesus did here was to elevate uh, this command to prominence. And he said that the command to love God and to love your neighbor has primacy. That every other command of God would fall in the category of loving God or loving your neighbor. That all of that would be hang on that. And James calls loving your neighbor as yourself a kingdom command, a royal command, meaning it's from the king, it's from Jesus, who is our Lord so that everything that we do in obedience to the king falls under this, love your neighbor as yourself. Showing partiality to the rich is commission of sin and is a violation of this royal command to love your neighbor as yourself. No one would want to enter into a gathering of Christians and be treated like they don't exist. And to show partiality to people simply because they had money and power, that was totally unacceptable to James. And he said, you're convicted by the law as transgressors because the law that is given by the king, that royal law, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then James says, now if you're careful to keep all of God's law, but you fail in one point of keeping all the law, you are guilty of breaking all of it. I can hear the folks in James Day saying something like this, hey, I don't really sin. I mean, not bad sin. I've never been unfaithful to my wife and I've never killed anybody. And I've actually had people reason with me that they didn't need to repent of any sin simply because they had never killed anybody and they had never uh, committed adultery on their wives. Well, whether it's unfaithfulness in your marriage or murdering a person, it's sin. And James ties those to the sin of so showing partiality. He's essentially saying if you show partiality, you're just as guilty as breaking the laws on murder and adultery. You know, interestingly, that's uh, a bit different from the way that we treat human law. Uh, we're responsible for all the law and we will be punished if we are caught, if you will, <laughs> breaking one of the laws, but we're not held accountable, uh, we're not guilty of all of it if we break one law. Here it says that we're accountable for it all. We break one law, we're guilty of breaking all of it. That is a fearsome statement. He says if you fawn over the rich, and ignore the poor, you're just as guilty as if you'd murdered someone. In fact, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. So don't do it. It's a big deal. And that's James' main point in this passage. But then he said, 
that in verse 12, he says, what you need to do is to live, to speak and act as those who are under the law of liberty. There's been much discussion um, for many years about what exactly James means here by the law of liberty, and there will be room for some disagreement, and I'm certainly not making a fellowship issue over this, but I'll give you what I think James is referring to um, when he speaks of the law of liberty. First, when, uh, when James wrote this, he was writing just 10 years or so after the church's Pentecostal birthday, if you will. So it was primarily the Judaism of that day, the Jews that had converted to Christ were primarily seen as a sect, a, a group within Judaism, a different like, the, like the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They would have been seen by the outside world as simply another group within that group. And that's how they were understood. And we've got some early writings of historians of the day actually attesting to that view that people on the outside looked at Jewish Christians in that day and saw it as a Jewish sect, not as a fulfilled messianic body of believers. Uh, speaking of the law of liberty, as James does here, and he's writing to Jews, and he himself is a faithful Jew, raised in uh, Nazareth, a very Jewish town, uh, it would have been quite a leap to talk about the law of Moses and then talk about the law of liberty. That is something that is substantively different from the law of Moses. And James very artfully, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says we're not just talking about the law of Moses here, we're talking about a perfect law of liberty. All their lives, Jews had been told to follow the law of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's highly unlikely that they had any other writings of the New Testament available, so there's no discussion of any other kind of law that could be called law in those days. There was Paul's writings to the Romans. None of Paul's writings would have been anywhere close to being written at that time. James seems to be, this book of James, written by the brother of Jesus, is kind of a bridge from the old law to the law of liberty. And I think that's a pivotal thing to understand here since it was the first of the New Testament writings written. This terminology would have been new to the Jews. Not the term law, that was a very old term, but the term law of liberty. And here in chapter 2, verse 12 of James, and also in James 1, 25, are the only places that this terminology, this phrase, is used in the New Testament, the law of liberty. What did, Jesus, what did James mean? This statement about the perfect law of liberty is truly transformative. It's different. This statement transforms our understanding of law or the commandments of God, not only in the law of Moses, but the whole idea of God's law. It is a law of liberty now. The idea that we find our standing with God, our favor before God by keeping commandments, that is the old way. That is not a law of liberty, but in fact, as Paul would say, probably 10 to 20 years later, that's a law that leads to slavery because nobody can keep the law perfectly. But that is the approach of the law of Moses in a general sense. Keep the rules, all the rules, and you're okay before God. And as a result, traditions and legalistic dogma and books and commentaries written by rabbis would then explain in an authoritative way, although they disagreed quite often, they would be explaining the laws of God in a way that people would need to follow that as well because obedience to the commands exactly was so very, very important. Now this understanding by the, of the law by the Jews of the first century seems to be what James is, has in mind here in the context of showing respect to persons. As he's already pointed out, he said, you can't pay special attention to the rich and ignore the poor without breaking the royal law which says to love your neighbor as yourself. 
You can't say that I'm loving my neighbor if I'm treating the rich with partiality. But the law of liberty is different from the law of Moses. And James makes the distinction. Now, James is not telling them to ignore what God had said in the law of Moses. That's not what he's saying. He's telling them, them to see this in another light. He's already made some pretty incredible statements about law and guilt before God. He said that if you fail in one point of the law, you're held accountable for breaking all of it, meaning that if you make one mistake, if you sin once, ignorantly or willfully, you are held just as guilty as if you had broken all the law. You can't rate sins and say, I haven't murdered anybody, or I haven't broken my marriage vows, therefore I'm, around, I'm okay with God. Well, James allows no such rationalization. Sin in one point, no matter how insig insignificant we think it might be, sin is still sin and makes us uh, guilty before the law of God. That's a fearsome assessment of our standing before God when you think about it. It's a fearsome assessment. Uh, in fact, James straightforwardly tells us that if, we, if we're, we're thinking we have right standing before God because of our superior obedience on basis of any law, Old or New Testament, then we are tragically mistaken because none of us can walk that line perfectly. It's why a law of liberty is perfect. It's complete. That's what the word perfect means. It's now the complete law of liberty. It's the only viable option for any human being wanting to be God's child. Speak and act as people who are judged by the law of liberty, James says. It's a new way of acting and living. It's a way paved by God's grace. Loving your neighbor is not just the final ingredient in the fulfillment of the law. Loving your neighbor is the whole concept of the law. It's the new norm among God's people. Our quest to obey is not found in a bigger magnifying glass to make inferences and draw out what we believe are God's commandments for us and to painstakingly obey the written word like some law book. We are commanded to act in a loving way. That is the royal law. Treat others as we would want to be treated. This is the way of the law of liberty. It is the way of Christ, and Christ articulated this in his conversation with Sadducees and Pharisees that day. Love God, love your neighbor. It's the foundation and substance of everything we do in Christ. These are the kingdom commands for following Jesus. If my standing before God is determined by flawless standing and perfect performance, I'm, I'm doomed, and, and you are too. But we are called to love our neighbor and love God. Serving God is loving our neighbor, simply put. And then in the last verse of our text today, verse 12, we're told, or verse 13, that we're told that judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. That mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank God for that. Raised in very strict churches, I've been told that, that obedience is absolutely essential. And it is absolutely essential. But perfect obedience is not possible. There is no such thing as perfect obedience. We need obedience that is produced by faith and nourished in grace. That's where the law of liberty comes from. We need God to decree us not guilty. Paul speaks much about this later in the book of Romans, perhaps 20, 25 years later. But I want to stay with James here. The law the earliest Jewish Christians were told to adhere to was the law of liberty. That they were a free people as we are, free from guilt, free from the power of sin, and the way we live this out in our own lives is to live out what the verse says at the end of our text, to show mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. To forgive, to understand, to treat all others with mercy, and to treat yourself with mercy. If you live in guilt for your legal failures before God, 
you live in fear. You live in guilt. You live trying to climb a mountain that you know you'll never summit. The law of liberty frees us from the fear of our own sin in our humanity. We are freed from guilt and shame and all the feelings that come with that. We are free from having to reach in our own power the peak of obedience, having accomplished enough to go to heaven when there is never enough one could do to merit going to heaven. And he says, James does, mercy wins out over judgment. This is God's justice we're talking about here. Not our judgment, not our harsh, critical, ignorant judgment about people's hearts. We're talking about God's judgment here, not the unfair judgment of humanity. And he says, James does, the Holy Spirit through James says, that God's mercy triumphs over his judgment. An incredible thing to say, since God's judgment is perfect. But God, in his compassion for creation, has actually shown that the victory comes through compassion and mercy, not through perfect equity or perfect justice. And for me, this is the heart of my gladness, that the God of perfect justice treats us with perfect mercy. There's confidence in our salvation, and I can speak and you can speak and act as people who live their lives under the law of liberty. There'll be more coming from James next time. I really appreciate your joining me for this study. God bless you, and we'll see you again.